Here we go then. R1200 RT. Well, I'd say immediately that feels smoother. So many buttons to press. I guess as long as I don't hit the ejector seat. Look at the river noon. I prefer the display on this, it's, uh, it's bigger for my old eyes. I felt I was straining a little bit with the GS. The uh, clock's very small on that. And it's interesting, with, uh, with the RT, it falls into the corners actually. It reminds me of the, um, don't laugh everybody, but it reminds me of the steering on my uh, GS550 Suzuki. I always used to describe the steering on that as being heavy. It just leaned into the corner and the bike steered itself. And Gary suggested I try to um, have a go at the, uh, the automatic gear changing on this. Well, not automatic, but you don't have to use the clutch. distance Neil well it's this this is amazing when you think again back since 1981 I've spent probably less than three hours on a bike including the hour that you've just seen in the previous episode uh, this just feels so easy to ride a book was written called blink I've never read it but somebody told me about it it basically says that we tend to make decisions instinctively uh, almost in the blink of an eye and our first impression is normally um, correct and my first impression on this bike is actually it just feels very very easy to ride feels commanding feels like I'm in a fighter cockpit but in terms of its handling not that I'm an expert you understand after five minutes but it just it's just that impression Screen down, buffeting, 50 miles an hour. Screen up, I've still got a good four or five inches of uh, distance over the top of the screen. I'm not by any means looking through the screen, and yet I'm actually protected from the, uh, the wind now. So, just to remind you, I'm not looking for a new BMW, I can't afford one of those. Well, it's not so much I can't afford it, but I, don't, I wouldn't want to spend the money on a new one. I don't, I don't think you need to. I learned a, a few years ago with cars, really, that it's always a good idea. Let someone else take the depreciation. With these bikes, they take huge mileage anyway, so, so I'm probably looking for a, a bike with between five and 10,000 miles on the clock. Uh, up to three years old, preferably two, preferably a 2015 model. Again, the advantage with the RT is that it does come with at least the panniers, and I guess if you're fortunate, you might get a top box as well. So, it does come with the day riding lamps built into it. Ooh, isn't that a lovely sound? This engine feels, I know it's supposed to be the same, it is, it is the same engine, it's not supposed to be the same engine, but it feels different. I, I suppose I was surprised at the harsh, in reflection, I was surprised at the harshness of the engine on the GS. Um, felt like it was rattling a bit, reminded me, and this, this is a really poor analogy, of when you know you've got a drill with a ratchet set on it and you overdo it and uh, the ratchet kicks in. It was that sense of, um, I think, vibration. It's, it's probably it's too unkind to call it harshness. Certainly not harshness. I have no idea what the speed limit is now, I must be honest. But 
this feels, I guess it's just been optimised by the uh, BMW people uh, to be very smooth. This is absolutely lovely to ride, I've got to say. This is the uh, just refinement, really. Mirrors are superb. Really good view of what's behind. And actually, you don't steer this, you just lean. If you lean, it steers itself. So I get a little bit of buffeting, it's got a bit more screen up. Yep, cured it. I've got to say, this feels right. Think about a BMW, I did some figures. I'll, I'll, again, I'll watch a little bit of YouTube and listen to a few people who own bikes. And my feeling is that on an annual basis, with the kind of miles I'll be doing, this bike is probably going to cost 350 quid a year more to own than a Suzuki V-Strom. Talk about love at first sight, but uh, I've got to say, this is... Uh, I feel very tempted by this. The danger, of course, with this sort of a bike is there's, there's lots of old blokes my age coming back to biking and they think, oh, I'd like to have a go at that. And then they go and buy something like this, it's too much for them. And it ends up being stuck in a garage and then sold 18 months later. I hope that doesn't happen to me. So it mirrors every eight seconds, Neil, keep reminding yourself. You see, I guess for most of you people watching this uh, video, you, you do a lot of what I'm now doing, but you do it without thinking about it. You are conscious, unconsciously competent. But as a back-to-biking biker, I physically have to compute almost everything. So, And the danger for me is when I find myself cruising along with actually... I've not thought about something, so I'm coming out of a roundabout, but I've not thought about the lifesaver, I've not thought about giving that um, signal when you're coming off the junction. It's overconfidence, I guess. But at the same time, um, again, you have to understand the way the brain works, that our brain um, is capable of making thousands and thousands of computations every second. And there are some things that we best, once we've practiced them enough, it's actually safer to let the brain just take care of that. The short form of that is, uh, you know, you, you get a piece of blank sheet of paper, put your signature on it ten times, you don't even think about it. Right, on the eleventh time, try and make an exact copy of the tenth signature that you put on. And you, when you think about it, you, you can't actually do it. You, 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 can't, you can't do it. Those of you who understand the game of cricket, it's the same with a, a fast bowler trying to think about his action. You can't run in and think about it. The golf swing is the same. You think about a golf swing, you know, you talk to, uh, you listen to the best golfers in the world and they'll say, when they hit the ball the best, they're thinking about absolutely nothing. Their brain is clear. All they're thinking about is where it's going. And interestingly, with this bike, I've literally moved into subconscious, or at least a level of subconscious competence within 10 or 15 minutes of getting on it. That's how, uh, that's how easy it feels. That's how natural it feels. And I know I'm not pushing the envelope, I know I'm not doing anything like that, I'm taking it very easy. But it's, uh, it's just an absolute joy at the moment, I've got to say. Two bikes in to my uh, big biking week road test. Started with the R1200 GS, we're now on the R1200 RT. Uh, later on in this week, I shall be in touch with um, Suzuki at Daventry. 
and I shall ride the 650 and the 1000 B Stroms. Uh, the challenge here, or the opportunity if you want to see it that way, is the fact that for let's say £10,500, 2017 economic conditions, you can own a brand new V-Strom 1000 XT and you can put a couple of thousand quids worth of jivvy um, engine bars, spoilers, lights. You could turn it into a very, very nice machine. It's a brand new bike. It's something nobody's ever ridden before. You're the first on it. And basically, from what I can gather, it's going to do everything, everything that the R1200 GS will do. Again, I forgot to do a lifesaver there, forgot to indicate off the junction, so just improve on that. So yeah, for ten and a half thousand pounds though, I'll probably need to go a little bit north of that on this, maybe near as probably to eleven thousand. But you can own one of these, a couple of years old, basically the SE, possibly even the LE version. You buy it from a BMW dealer. Then you're going to get your 24 month warranty on it. It's going to cost more to own every year, you know, 350, 400, 500 pounds maybe. But you're riding a BMW. I think I now know what all the fuss is about. I feel absolutely blessed today to be riding through my country, which I love, England, on an absolutely cracking piece of motorbiking kit. It's funny, when you, you can basically, within reason, you can have what you want as a bike and it's so difficult to work out what to do. And for months and months and months I decided this was the bike I wanted to own. Yeah, so I want, a, I want a, a 1200RT, I'm going to buy a used one for my uh, armchair wisdom and all my second-hand knowledge. So, I go for my... go for my uh, instruction day, back to biking instruction day. Thanks to Tim again. My biking mentor, good bloke. Exceptional bloke. He's almost to meet him. And he mentions the fact that uh, in a few days' time, Suzuki are holding a cafe ride event at the Super Sausage Cafe on the A5. Famous bikers' cafe in the UK. Do a cracking good uh, fry up there. Proper food, proper English food. So I go along. I ride the 650 V Strom in the morning. And by the way, I'd never even heard of a V Strom the day before. Well, sorry, not a day before, probably three or four days before. I'd never even heard of it. I thought, if I'm going to go along to this event, that sounds like a good idea. It'll give me an extra couple of hours on the saddle. It'll build on my training. Start, you know, keep, get me another step on the road back into it. So I did a bit of homework and I thought, well, I don't want to be on any of the sports bikes. That would be crazy. So, so pick, pick out the easiest bike to ride, the 650. Again, watch the YouTube videos, read the road tests. Got on it that morning. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. And then when I was there, I thought, well, why don't I also have a go at the 1,000? So again, that just felt a bit heavy. It's about £40 heavier, I think. But again, very easy to ride. Last time I was on the 1,000cc was Steve Jackson's Z1000 on the A59 when I went to buy his Honda 250 Dream. That was the last time, and I was just a passenger then. So, But yeah, very easy bike to ride. So I came away from that thinking, do you know, I could, I could live with either of those two. And the pendulum swung, so the 1200RT was then off the agenda, the V-Strom was on it, and then I got on this thing, and now the pendulum swung back the other way. I used to be indecisive, but now I'm not so sure. Or as Hamlet put it, to be or not to be, that is the question. So at this stage, I wonder what you'd do in my position. 
My um, vital statistics, by the way, just over six feet tall. About 14 stone, quite fit, reasonably fit. So strength-wise, I can handle this. I think this is a bike you could basically could take you anywhere you wanted to go. Actually, in in a real sense of comfort and style as well. So you just really uh, enjoy the landscape and. Again, that's one of the things I really want to get into. I love, I've got a passion for history. I've got a passion for archeology. span I love the English landscape. I love its origins. I love the shapes of the fields. I love the earthworks. I always wonder what's under the ground as well. A few weeks back, uh, I'm part of uh, a local archaeological group and uh, we uh, were recovering uh, three skeletons, three Anglo-Saxon skeletons from a field not too far from me. And people have been walking this land for a long time. Twisty bends taken very very cautiously at this stage. A bit more experience, we'll probably go through those a little bit faster. My golden rule today is always to be able to stop in the distance I can see to be safe, whether it's the crest of a hill or a left or a right hand bend. That chap's been following me for about 10 minutes, probably thinking these people with big bikes who can't ride them, and he'd be absolutely right. Yeah, there's none of the sense of harshness in this engine, I would say. Um, but uh, I detected on the GS, and it's probably because I'm uh, I'm probably going softly by old age. But this, to me, would seem the optimum bike on the basis that, well, versus the GS anyway. On the basis with the GS, I'm never going to go off-road. Not going to do that. idea is get out see the landscape, a bit of a stress buster a few times a week, nice dry weather get out, a bit of sunshine, but occasionally get myself out Lake District, North Yorkshire Moors, do you really fancy doing the North Coast 500 route in Scotland as well? Try this screen right up, shall we? Put it back down again. Well, these miles are just floating by, not even thinking about it. The challenge for me is when we going through a town, uh, going through some of the uh, stuff where I've got to do more of the slow manoeuvres with this level of weight, I guess. On this bike, it's um, this, this, is, this is obviously going to be easy. So it's noticeable when you accelerate, you do get that sort of slight buzziness. Which I detected on the, uh, the GS, but not quite as much. But I think I read somewhere that the engine is... Uh, is it a heavier flywheel or something? Nice time to ride this, Monday morning, round about lunchtime, everyone's at work, roads are quiet, a good time for me. Over the Great Ouse, flows out into the Fens, eastern England. Now this um, bit of dual carriageway now just gives me a chance to um, get a sense as to what she's like as a cruiser in terms of uh, wind buffeting and so forth. Well, I guess this uh, bike's built for roads like this, but again. Is that positive or negative? I'll be spending at least as much time 
on uh, little twisty roads. As I do on dual carriageways, a lot more time, probably. At least 80 20, I would think, in favour of the smaller roads. She just lopes along. I've got a Shuey Neotech on, which again, like everything else I have, is brand new. And it's got that many vents and flaps on it. Again, I've no idea really what I'm supposed to be doing, so... I don't want to mess around too much, I'd rather concentrate on the road. So I'm now riding with the... Uh just a little blast of fresh air with the visor up, let's stick it back down again. There we are. Don't know what difference that makes to the sound quality on the uh, video. Might laugh at this, but all my gear, I didn't really know how to put it on, so I've put it on five or six times and walked around the house, much to the amusement of my family. Trying to look like Steve McQueen. Little sneaky average speed camera up there. Just catching you just as you leave the village. Now we're back onto the uh, national single carriageway speed limit. 60 mph. Well, I feel very at home on this. I feel more relaxed on this than I did on the GS. Now, is that because this is the bike I've ridden second? Or is it because it's the more the bike that suits me better? I've got to say, generally, it just feels a little more refined. It feels less buzzy. I feel as though I'm uh, better insulated from the elements, and yet at the same time, it's. Uh, I've got to say, it's actually quite a bit of fun. Actually, I know. Again, I'm not doing anything like testing its capabilities, but you've got to see where where I am. As I say, since. Uh, the last bike I physically rode back in 1981 was an FS1E, which I rode for six months, 49 cc's, and now here I am on a 1200, and since that time I've had about probably three, three hours in the saddle, maybe four, something like that. But the brain's a marvellous instrument, it stores, it stores um, skills away, brings them out again. Sometimes they need a bit of honing, a bit of, bit of polishing, but your brain will work if you trust it. Long-term memory is an amazing thing. My mother's 90 years old, lives with us, we look after her. Short-term memory, can't remember what you said 30 seconds ago, literally. But she'll tell you all about what happened in the lead-up to this World, World War II. She's an interesting lady. She pioneered food in Ludlow, Ludlow pubs in the 1960s. Ludlow's now a real foodie town. Well, my mum pioneered that. My dad was a founder member of the BBC, 1921. Invented the world's first ever valve tester. Radio valve tester came out of the Royal Signals. So my granddad, her dad, he was um, quite an interesting character. He, uh, he joined up at the age of 15, World War I. His commanding officer found out he was only 15, so he said, look George, you can't stay on the front line. So he basically sent him into the Royal Signals, where he started to understand the art of radio. As he came out, came out Demobbed in 1918, not knowing what to do with his life, or well, at least having some idea, but at that stage hadn't made the decision. So he's washing cars at Brown and Malaloo's in Blackpool, 1919, probably maybe 1920, something like that. And he's got two friends. One's a guy called Bill Lyons. 
Bill Lyons has done an engineering apprenticeship since he left the army and he wants to build sidecars. Got this idea. Just trying to remember the name of the other friend. Oh, that was it. Frank Taylor. Frank Taylor's borrowed £500 off his mum and dad. He's going to build a couple of houses in Blackpool. And Frank Taylor says to my dad, my granddad, do you want to come in with me? And uh, granddad says, no, I'm going to have an idea. I want to get into radios. Bill Lyons says, do you want to come in with me, George? George says, no, I want to build radios. So, Grandad builds his business. Like I say, he invents the world's first wind-up torch in the days when batteries were very rare. Hard to get hold of in the world, just before and during World War II. He invents the world's first valve tester. And I can't remember if it's either Ferranti or... He sells it to either Ferranti or Marconi. He sells them the, uh, the parts. And Grandad isn't very good at managing intellectual property rights. So he, um, unfortunately, they take his idea from him and make a lot of money out of it. But he also then goes on to set up uh, the biggest chain of uh, rental TV shops in Blackpool. Very successful businessman, actually, eventually, but died quite young. Um, you might be interested to hear what happened to the other two. So Frank Taylor builds his house, builds his two houses on... Uh, Central Drive in Blackpool and goes on to found a business which is now known as Taylor Woodrow one of the largest building companies in the world and Bill Lyons builds his sidecars at a factory on Cocker Street in Blackpool Swallow Sidecars it was called Swallow Sidecars becomes SS Jaguar Jaguar Cars Funny old thing, isn't it, history? Anyway, I digress, but interesting, might be interested in that. Let me know your comments. Well, this bike, I've got to say, around these little, well, not so much twisty lanes, but at least they've got bends in them, just suited to my uh, abilities. I'm really enjoying this. I don't feel at all threatened or intimidated by this bike. I feel at home on it. I feel as though it's doing a job for me. I feel as though I could quite confidently go a long way on this. I suppose the only slight question mark is what's it like around the sort of smaller lanes? I mean, I think you could probably pull trees over with this. It's got a lot of power there, a lot of torque. But again, on the previous video, I think I mentioned the fact that the bike I buy, in a funny kind of way, I don't want to feel over comfortable with it. I want something that's going to um, give me a bit of a, cha a technical challenge to extend my my riding skills. Something, one of the challenges I want, as you get towards your sort of late 50s, you start to think of pipe and slippers and warm firesides and all that kind of stuff. But I made my mind up this year, I was uh, going to put some effort into making myself fitter, get my brain sharpened up. Uh, and as part of that challenge, as part of that challenge, I, uh, I wanted to get out on a bike because I just felt it would, I'd get to meet some new people, I'd go to some place I'd never been before. It's just something I can just jump on and go out and have a bit of fun on. On the sharpening the brain up front, a uh, little story there, I bought, so I've always wanted to be able to do the Times crossword. And I, on average, I could do no clues or one clue on the Times crossword, so I bought myself a book on the Times crossword. What's really annoying now is that my wife, who has never read this book, uh, stopped, picked up the crossword puzzles that I struggle with, and she can do 80% of them. She's a good lady. Again, just swinging out a little wider than I want to do there, really, but again, I'm just uh, getting used to this. Just quite happy to pootle along. So 
so yeah, we're going into um, stage two now, test ride number two, the week of the four bikes. The R1200 GS, the R1200 RT, and then we're contact those nice people at Suzuki and Daventry. I shall be riding the two V-Stroms, the 650 and the 1000. And then it's make your mind up time. Hope you're impressed with my slow speed control there, but I think I take none of the credit. I think all the credit goes to this 1200 actually, because it's... Uh, I get the impression you could almost come to a complete stop and just uh, it wouldn't fall over. So, goes without saying, it's a very comfortable machine. I'm sure most of you watching this will tell me an awful lot more about it than I can tell you. But, the purpose of these videos, this series of videos, I think that initially there's going to be five videos, um, is just simply just to try to put a, down a record on YouTube of my journey back to the bike and the kind of things I've had to think about. As I say, literally, I started with a clean... Well, I'll tell you what started it off, actually. Um, again, quite an interesting story, but I'm a big fan of Inspector Morse. That's the sort of Times crossword connection, by the way, but he's much better at it than me. Um, and we don't live too far away from Oxfordshire, so one day I said to my wife, come on, let's go to the um, Inspector Morse pub where he filmed the, the last episode, The Remorseful Day. So anyway, we turn up there, beautiful lunchtime, quite quiet, and suddenly roar of motorbikes. Seven or eight motorbikes appear, great big things. And uh, I'd been buying the occasional bike magazine, but uh, I got talking to these people. What was interesting was the average age was 70. And they said, oh, come on, have a sit on this. So I let me sit on this great big Triumph. I didn't know any of the names of the bikes at this stage. And I think that was basically what drew me in. So I'm sitting where Inspector Moore sat in that final episode as he recites that poem from Hey Hausman, The Remorseful Day. And I think it was like, uh, <coughs> I don't know what the, what the right word is, synchronicity or something like that, but uh, I thought, hmm. And I think that was what tipped the balance. I thought, right, I've got to take this seriously now. So that was quite a few months ago. So since then, I've really been researching thinking, watching lots of YouTube, reading road tests. And the thing is, when you've got absolutely nothing, you don't have any kit, you don't have a bike, you don't know what bike to go for, where do you start? So I did actually go into BMWs in Northampton, had a chat with them, went into the Suzuki store at Daventry, had a chat with them. Again, people very generous with the knowledge, Conversed a lot on Twitter, best I could. And then I, you basically, in any undertaking, you have to take a first step, don't you? The step of faith. Faith needs legs, so, so the legs in my case was right, I'll go and buy the kit. So, got in the car, sports bike shop, literally bought everything. Again, I'd done some homework, I had some ideas, thought I knew what I wanted when I came out with something completely different. But again, got a lot of good help. So I bought my kit, so I came back with all these cardboard boxes and bags. Put it all on, walked through the house. Did that several times. Next stage then, back to biking course. So again, a couple hundred quid, money very well spent. So the instructor Tim just structured a day for me, so I spent the morning 
first two hours or so, just get imagine just jumping back on the bike first time you've done it in 37 years. Just riding around a few traffic cones in a car park. Emergency stops, junctions, indicating, control stops, lifesavers. So my, my brain was absolutely frying and then we went out first of all before lunch for an hour. Just a relatively easy sort of rural ride, just to get the feeling of being on the road. So I'm pulling out at junctions and swinging wide because I haven't got the sort of slow control skills. Forgetting to turn my indicators off. Making lots of mistakes. As they say, fail often, fail better. Afternoon, like I mentioned in the previous video, we went out to Old Warden. Wonderful place, nice cafe. And watched the hurricane take off and land. Which was an absolute privilege. I'd have paid the entrance fee just to watch that, to be honest. So. So that was the next stage then, so at that, by that stage then I'd, uh, I'd done a two hours around the car park mm. Indicate, lifesaver, just check on the left Yeah, so two hours around the car park, two hours on the roads and then, as I say, the uh, instructor Tim mentioned the fact of the Suzuki cafe ride. So I thought it was a nothing else, an opportunity to, just to get maybe another hour on the bike. So, so 35 minute ride on the V-Strom 650 in the morning. And then early morning, it was about uh, 9.15. Again, the roads are quiet. I picked a quiet time. And then... Uh, around about 11 o'clock they had a spare slot for a thousand so I jumped on that and went out on that so mounting the hours up, mounting up a bit of experience, different kinds of bikes and then had a busy week with work decorating and so forth, you know the usual things over the last couple of weeks last week and a half or so and then I rang uh, Gary up at uh, Wollaston's in Northampton and he very kindly has given me the opportunity to ride the, the GS and the RT so and that's where we're up to, so later on this week I shall be in touch with uh, Libby at Suzuki Daventry and we shall ride the two Suzukis but I've got to say, got to be honest, got to declare an interest this is going to take a fair bit of beating, I think so on the sort of straight now back into uh, to Northampton Right hand's going a bit numb, but I think that's probably me gripping it, gripping the throttle too hard, not relaxed enough, because I'm thinking about everything. So I've also been reading the uh, police advanced riding manual, so uh, maybe a, a bit of a bridge too far at this stage, but uh, I've memorised the uh, information, position, speed, gear, acceleration uh, acronym. A lot to learn. So another question is, when I buy my bike, should I do the advanced riding course? Should I do it straight away? Should I do it after six months? After 12 months? What do you think? It's funny, at the surge of power, this might sound a bit crazy, so forgive me for this one. Uh, going surfing in Cornwall, I'm not a stand-up surfer, I'm a sort of a bodyboard surfer. And occasionally, Falls F Beach, you know, the waves are just right, three to four feet, and you just catch one, don't you? And you think it just basically almost takes your breath away with the power. Not so much the power, but the fact that that's probably the wrong word, but it's just irresistible. And it's smooth, and it just basically keeps on pushing. And that's how this feels. I can't think on a bike like this I would ever exhaust its possibilities or ever touch any part of its envelope. And I mean that in the aerospace sense of the word, every aircraft has a flight envelope. How high it can fly, what's the altitude it can fly, how, how, much, how fast it can turn. Basically you put all the parameters on one picture. 
looks a bit like a sort of a, a weird parallelogram type thing. It's known as the aircraft's performance envelope. And basically test pilots define that. My instructor talked about three zones of visibility when he trained me. He said zone one is basically everything you can see uh, in front of you. Uh, zone two is everything that's behind you that essentially you're seeing through your mirrors. And zone three he described as the blind spot. Essentially for me that's what's over my right shoulder but I guess also what's over the left hand shoulder. So um, what you get on this uh, RT is a wonderful zone one and zone two. These mirrors I know there have been different opinions on them, but they, um, they do give you a really good sense as to what's behind you. And maybe I guess with Zone 3, I've seen a few people with these little curvy mirror type things you can glue onto your mirrors, or glue onto your dashboard, that just gives you maybe a clue as to whether someone's crept up on that blind spot. Now the bike keeps bleeping at me every now and again, is that saying that I'm an idiot rider and really she's too good for me or is it that something's about to happen I've no idea what you open the taps at 70 and I mean it just it just pushes but I guess you all knew that didn't you well what a privilege it is to ride this the fact you can just walk into a dealer you know, you don't want to waste their time, but, um, you know, and you can uh, prepare to lend you a machine like this, which I guess you won't get much change out of £20,000 on, and just take it out for an hour. How good is that? So a big shout out to Wollaston's BMW in Northampton, Gary. Thank you. Food for thought indeed. And I can tell you, when I've done these two test rides today, I'll be absolutely shattered later on, because just mentally, the uh, for me, the level of concentration is 100%. I don't know what that's like for you experienced riders. You know, if you're uh, an advanced rider, you've been riding 20 or 30 years continually, do you feel as tired when you get off uh, your bike as I'm going to feel when I get off this? get back into my Volvo which is going to be a bit of a come down but she's been a faithful old girl as well three hundred thousand miles on the clock 50 to a gallon like sitting in an old armchair lovely old girl 15 years old now I always believe you should, you should buy the best you can, buy the best you can afford that's going to do the job for you and then get the value out of it, don't sell it too soon and that way you don't get bitten by depreciation I'm beginning to think with this screen actually, because it's not allowing the air, it's sending the air over my head, is it allowing the helmet to vent as it should? So this, this idea that I've got um, condensation, uh, particularly on the right side of my uh, visor, uh, not, it's not um, stopping me seeing at the moment, but maybe on a cold day would it, would it do that? So maybe if you either got to have the screen right down, or maybe ride with your visor up, I don't know. Again, thoughts on a postcard. It's interesting, the last 20 minutes I've been riding this without even thinking about it, so we're back into this area of uh, subconscious semi-competence. Not thinking about it. Need to think consciously about doing the lifesavers, the, uh, the mirror check every eight seconds. But what I can say to anyone else who's in my position who wants to come back to biking, um, this process has worked for me. Um, so I hope that's, hope that's helpful. I guess you can learn by other people's mistakes as well as what they get right and I'm sure I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. So.
I guess the test for this bike, and I think it's something I've not really been able to examine on this ride, is what's it like on the smaller roads. Obviously perfect on the ride we've just done. But on the smaller roads, what's it going to be like? Is it going to be as user friendly? Or is it a sledgehammer to crack a nut? Can't examine that today. So on the basis that today is, um, if I decided to go for the RT, then I think I'd probably want to take one out for a more extended run first. Maybe that would be the time to do that. I'd have a little more confidence as well. A few more sea towers. Let's get out away from this bus. I think that's a question that needs to be asked. 